Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night uh, to the world. Uh, I am uh, from Japan. Uh, welcome uh, to the webinar, uh, the Epiphysis Advisory Case by Case Step by Step. This webinar uh, is uh, a part of activities of Epiphysis Advisory Task Force, uh, ILAE, uh, Asia Oceania. Uh, trying to uh, reduce uh, the treatment gap uh, of epilepsy in Asian uh, Oceanian region. Uh, it is very important uh, for our region to provide uh, this kind of webinar about uh, basic concept and skills of surgical treatment of epilepsy. And uh, we do th uh, this uh, step by step and case by case uh, to improve uh, uh, your understanding uh, and uh, utility. And uh, this is uh, the tenth session. Uh, we finished uh, the seven sessions of temporal lobe epilepsy, and today is the uh, third session of lobe uh, epilepsy, and specifically about uh, basal uh, frontal, uh, the orbital frontal area. Okay, uh, now I hand uh, the uh, chair to uh, Professor Sarah Chandra, who is a, a convener and a main contributor of this uh, webinar series. Okay, Sarah, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kensuki. Now, I would like to share the screen. So we are now, as Professor Kensuki has already said, we are now doing the series 10, which would be on basic frontal epilepsy. And uh, there is a small announcement that the whole webinar series is being supported by IPCA. And we are great, grateful for that because they have provided us an unrestricted grant. So we will have first a case presentation by Manjari, uh, and the case presentation will be for 45 minutes, after which we'll have a 15 minutes of discussion, and it will be an interactive discussion. And she would present case as it would be shown real time in any epilepsy surgery meeting. And the current faculty are blinded to the case in the sense they do not have any idea of what is the cases. And this is what most of our viewers wanted, so that they wanted to see how the faculty could actually in real time are able to take decisions, particularly for complex cases. I have the pleasure of introducing two very well-renowned, esteemed faculty, Professor George Jallo, who is a professor of neurosurgery from John Hopkins, uh, which is rated as one of the best in institutes globally. He is a medical director of pediatric neurosurgery. So epilepsy happens to be one of the main key areas even though he is an expert surgeon in several other areas too. He is also the medical director for Institute of Brain Protection Services at John Hopkins. And, and we really look forward for his lecture. He would be giving a short, he would be giving a didactic lecture after the case presentation on the surgical management of basic frontal epilepsy. And then I have an equal pleasure of introducing Professor Erasmo A. Pesaro, who is again from John Hopkins. He's a medical director of the epilepsy surgery program. So very important key person for the success of any epilepsy surgery program. Uh, and uh, we again look forward for his lecture and his contribution to the case uh, based scenario. So now uh, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and I will request Manjari to start a case. So it's 5.04. So I will request her to finish the case in 45 minutes so that we have plenty of time for discussion and then again for case presentations by our faculty. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandra, and thank you, Dr. Ikida and Dr. John Dunn and uh, Dr. Kensuke. So um, I will be presenting a case. Of course, uh, this case uh, is a little challenging because we had several mm -hmm. uh, pre-surgical... Manjari, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. There is something I forgot. I have to, of course, mention that as mentioned by Professor mm -hmm. Kawai, uh, this has been supported by the leadership of AOILE. And in this regard, I'm very grateful to Professor John Dunn, who is currently the chair of AOILE, and Professor Akio Ikida, who was the past chair, and we started when he was the chair of AOILE. And I'm very grateful that uh, with their leadership, we are able to do all this series. Sorry, sorry about that. So you can uh -huh. now... Yeah. So uh, this case was uh, actually discussed several times in our pre-surgical evaluation meeting because we found it to be pretty challenging. And uh, 
she's a young uh, teenager she's around 13 14 years old and she was bought from the western state western far western uh, city in india uh, which is about say uh, 700 kilometers away uh, she had her seizures uh, which started at the age of one and a half uh, years of age and they kept on happening in a unrelenting manner and uh, their usual frequency uh, used to be about 2 uh, to 10 a month and it would these episodes would cluster and the mother was very very aware of these episodes uh, uh, because they would all occur during her sleep and in india there is uh, a pattern of co uh, you know co sleeping because uh, especially since the kid uh, was having these episodes right from one and a half years of age the mother used to co sleep with the child and uh, she would pick up a restless movement in the child um, which would be very very brief and this used to be associated with some movement of the eyes and uh, the child would wake up and the whole family would in fact wake up because there were several such um, occurring in clusters uh, about 2 to 10 times in a month and every cluster she would have about 5 or 6 episodes in sleep 90% of the episodes occurred in sleep she had been tried on many many drugs uh, she had been started on carbamazepine valproate oxcarbamazepine zonisamide levetiracetam and none of none of the drugs had, had actually produced any benefit uh, and which is when she uh, sought to travel a long distance to show us um there were no precipitating factors except sleep so sleeping at any time of the day or even the night would provoke uh, episodes and there would be uh, periods when uh, you know the mother had uh, the parents had got fed up of giving medication to the child and they had actually stopped the medicine because nothing was making a difference and in those uh, periods where they had stopped the medicines uh, there would be uh, you know a bigger big big episode which the parents said would uh, she would just Uh, have stiffening and movements of all four limbs and uh, often be incontinent um, with falling off the bed so there were episodes uh, particularly in periods where she was pulled off her medicines because of the frustration of uh, nothing working for uh, her that she would have these generalized uh, episodes what the mother uh, described was that in sleep the child would move her right leg and sometimes her right hand and uh, the eyes would move uh, she was unable to tell the direction because the eyes would be closed when they are moving so all she would see is that the eyes are moving and uh, she would not uh, see whether they were moving to the right or uh, left and this was the description it used to last for a few seconds she says maybe 15 seconds maybe 20 seconds or even less than that and then the child would be uh, you know usually get up and then go back to sleep and then after a few minutes have the episode again and they would happen in the beginning of the night not towards the last part of the night or early morning but they would occur like uh, if she slept at 10 they would occur around 12 or 11:30 and they would never occur at 5 or 6 in the morning so uh, this was a history and um, uh, if you looked at her birth history there was no history of any perinatal hypoxia or any problems during delivery to the mom there was no history of febrile seizures there was no history of head injury there was no history of any meningitis or encephalitis there was no family history of similar episodes occurring in the night and there was no significant uh, past history at all uh, she was internal sleep started getting disrupted it was very difficult for her to uh, remember things and uh, she dropped out of school or rather the parents chose not to send her to school because um, there was a complete disruption of their own sleep wake cycle as well as the child's so um uh, apart from that on examination she had no focal deficits no neurocutaneous markers uh and no comorbidity so with this history our hypothesis was that she was having very brief seizures which were occurring in sleep mostly out of sleep um and we had no doubt in our mind that the child was in fact having uh, some form of frontal lobe seizures uh there was no typical hypermotor or thrashing behavior so uh what we could only find is some right sided movements and so history wise we could kind of lateralize to the left um there was no typical you know out extension of the hand like you would see in a supplementary motor area 
or clonic movements like you would see elementary motor movements clonic or tonic so it was difficult to uh, localize to pe- uh, the rolandic or peri rolandic um, apart from that there was no aura or there was no forced thinking um, or gesturing of the face or any other part of the body so it was difficult to localize uh, sub uh, at a sub global level from the history so with this uh, we had her interictal eg and as we can see here uh, she did sleep in the interictal eg because we had asked for a sleep deprived eg and you can see here that uh, in the interictal epic which is the average uh, epic which i have posted uh, here um she had some sharps um which were seen and these were seen uh, in the left sided uh, you know electrodes um with uh, with a kind of a fast rhythm which you see here which you seen at fp1 with a spiking at uh, the anterior uh, sorry at the posterior frontal f7 and uh, so this is what we found in the interictal occurring very frequently and uh, there were some um, sharpish low waves uh, in the frontal central we were not sure whether these are runs of k complexes um, so this was all the finding we had in her interictal uh, uh, there was absolutely nothing in the wake record but the sleep did pick up this so i'd like comments of dr ikida and uh, dr rasmo uh, on the interictal eg uh, could you hear me <clears throat> yes i understand that the patient is not 13 years old the girl so the uh, in this the age group but except transient is sometimes very spiky and the high amplitude so when you show that the some the uh, f7 uh, t3 and then the fz and cz some of them uh, the quite spiky and the large amplitude but i certainly need to distinguish from uh, epileptic discharge Uh, and the <clears throat> debatic shaft transient the thing is that the uh, the it seems to be the largest that's the uh, midline frontal and then the vertex so i'm uh, a little bit concerned about the dis- uh, distinction between the two but i i i appreciate that some of them is that the seen at the fz and also uh, and f7 so that is the candidate activity that's what i could say at this moment thank you dr kida uh dr rasmo yes so i agree uh, i mean there's an f7 t3 um you know spike um that is slow wave and then uh, I mean, it looks like um uh, the patient's asleep and then maybe there's an arousal so it's hard to say with just one sample of if that's sleep morphology or or actual sharps um clearly your sharps in the midline can be activated in sleep it looks like there's a, like an arousal that occurs um here so um um yeah so uh, i agree that you know one one epic it's difficult to say and i would love to have time enough to discuss the whole eg but this was essentially the finding which was there so Yeah, and definitely she's in sleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So shall shall we move on? So um, she was um, uh, she was right-handed, and uh, she had a neuropsychology evaluation done before getting her into the video EG, and she <clears throat> was oriented to time and person, but month or date, uh, she was not able to say and to eye contact. Her mental age was 10 years. She had a reduced general knowledge, reduced comprehension, reduced working memory, reduced attention and concentration. And, uh, you know, her uh, performance ability was uh, average. So she had a borderline intellectual functioning, and which is one of the reasons that the parents may have just not sent her to school because they would have found her difficult to cope with the studies. Um, so on cognitive evaluation, recall and new learning ability moderately impaired delayed recall and visual retention moderate to severely impaired uh, on recent memory attention and concentration so attention and concentration seem to be really impacted in both the evaluations and uh, she did have an impaired remote and temporal sequence so cognitively she was impacted and whether it's the effect of several of the seizures sleep deprivation she was having because of the disturbed sleep 
and multiple anti-seizure medicines, some of which have cognitive impact, uh, is something which we were thinking about. So then we uh, did connect her to a video G, and I will show some events. And the events are really very brief. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are two events, so I will play both of them uh, in sequence. Um, and uh, uh, so let's start with this one. She's sleeping. So you can see that the mother recognizes, she says, Iskwara, that is the event is happening. And I'll play it again because it was so subtle. That was the equal spec. So that was all the event, um, and she res she responds immediately. So uh, basically, she, the staff is testing her for the words she had given during the event. But the event was essentially very brief. Uh, any comments on the event, Dr. Ikida and Dr. Rasmo? I just briefly say that the, could you hear me? Yes, yes. What I found is that the initial 10 seconds of uh, presumably the right foot uh, the very mild uh, automatism like movement and also right hand automatism like movement. Otherwise, I can't find that any specific semiology, uh, except for that the, the seizure is very brief and then the uh, patient is presumably quite well oriented, being consistent with that the some uh, uh, focus seizure arising from that the frontal lobe. But the uh, it's a little bit difficult to point out to any specific semiology at this moment. Dr. Rasmo? Yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Key that the semiology is rather bland. It makes it very uh, difficult to, uh, um, to, to you know, localize or even lateralize. The, the one question I have is for the, uh, and I know the patient has cognitive problems, for the rare, very rare awake seizure, does um, the patient ever describe any type of aura? No, she never, she, in fact, repeated probing, uh, she would, uh, she would look blankly, she would say nothing, like, she couldn't perceive anything, whether it was in the head or whether it was in the epigastrium, or whether it was hemisensory, nothing. So she was just, she would just look blankly, and she would even wonder, uh, you know, why people are uh, examining her in the sleep and uh, asking her all sort of questions after the event. So uh, she was totally blank, there was no aura ever, uh, either in the awake or in the sleep uh, episodes, yeah. Any um, autonomic symptoms? Um, no, not, no, no, no sweating, no pyloerection, no palpitations, uh, 
nothing such. Yeah. Manjari, I'd like to see the second seizure, but I appreciate okay. um, it's uh, uh, what I do appreciate is the <laughs> automism in the foot. The face turns towards the left, and then the arm uh, was my you know the way I. I so I, I, uh, I can play it again. So. Uh, we were not sure if they were automatisms in the leg. In fact, it almost looked like a myoclonic, tonic kind of movement uh, to us. So I'll just play it again. Okay. So uh, uh, we were not sure if they are automatisms because it just jerked and then there was some some kind of holding of the jerk and the right hand kind of just went up. There was no uh, movements per se of the fingers. So um, yeah, we can go to the EG of this event and then we can uh, go to the second event. So, so I, uh, I, I yeah. have one comment. Uh, so with that, it, um, yeah, I'm glad we saw that again. Because I, I agree that the, the leg extends and then the foot um, inverts. Um, yeah. the, the leg becomes tonic and then the foot inverts, which makes me think if that if, if that's how it always starts, that that might not may not be an automatism. And then with the arm, there's nothing distal and the arm moves. So I don't know if it's a proximal arm movement, uh, but that, that might be you know helpful because we've got the, the leg extending and then potentially the proximal arm um, and then the hand, you know, the distal arm is passively moving because the proximal um, limb is uh, moving in the upper extremity. So we then went to look at, the, uh, you know, this is the epoch where the event starts. And uh, as you can see here, um, there is some slowing which comes in uh, it's of the delta range. Um, and before that slowing, there is some kind of a very brief, fast buzz, which is seen in the frontal FP1. Uh, that slowing kind of picks up later uh, here. Now, uh, it's also seen uh, at the F3 here. Uh, so the slowing definitely starts in the left frontal. And we had a hard time deciding whether these were just the eye movements which were happening or whether this was indeed, uh, you know, more than that. And the fact that it was spilling over Two F73 uh, electrodes made us think more in terms of it being a delta um, onset rhythm. And so this is the next epoch. Uh, nothing much here. Uh, we literally had to think whether it was an event at all. And as we go to the next epoch, we find that there's this uh, almost like a polymorphic intermittent delta with some buried spikes which are seen um, in the left frontal, um, also reflecting on the right side, but mostly on the left. And uh, we can see here again this uh, rhythmic activity, which is in the slow range, uh, and it continues. Um, so basically, this was all, and this was a change in the montage. So this was the average montage, and so we to the double banana in the same episode and you can see again here that there was a slowing which was seen at f3 and f7 uh, and as we go along this was the next epoch so basically that was uh, what we found in the eg um, any comments on that uh, dr kida Yes, the, I totally agree that this, especially that the initial parts of this the polymorphic delta of about the two seconds involving that the FP1 and the and the uh, to some F the F, F3 and then this uh, C3, but it is the as you mentioned, the, the quite well localized that the uh, more rostral parts. And then the, that's is not extended into that much more posterior parts. Yeah. So, 
uh, but the uh, I, I I think it is a little bit different from that waveform, from the viewpoints of the EM, EEG, uh, EOG artifact. So I I it is most likely this is the polymorphic delta of uh, 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 brain activity, and then the thing is that that can be located at the left uh, anterior quadrant, and then some of them, as you pointed out now. Some very spiky activity was also seen yeah. uh, exclusively on the left uh, anterior quadrant. So I, 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 that's taking the, all these kind of finding. Something's ongoing on that the left anterior quadrant. Uh, but uh, the, nevertheless, uh, we didn't see any low voltage fast activity and so on. So that may be some sort of uh, <clears throat> the. I don't know that they're not the beginning of the dicta pattern, but some sort of uh, uh, a large uh, spreading activity. But I don't know at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Rasmo? Yeah, so I think Dr. Akira on the, um, the final slide, more on the left. And then also at the beginning, right before the EG changes. Uh, uh, your uh, voice is a bit uh, faint. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, so yeah, I agree with Dr. Keita about the frontal slowing, particularly more so on the left. At the beginning of the seizure, it's interesting. I, I see uh, an alpha rhythm on um, only one side. Can we go to the first slide? Yes. So this uh, is what perplexed us. There was this alpha seen on the left, but not on the right. Yeah. Dr. Asmo? Yeah, so I'm not sure what to make of that. So we see, you know, because the alpha persists, but there's dropout on the right beforehand. Um, just something to note, I'm not sure. And I imagine, interactively, that wasn't consistent. Um, right? No, it wasn't consistent. It wasn't okay. consistent. Manjari, um, yes. I just... I just wanted to raise a couple of technical points. Obviously, yeah. we're, lim we're limited by uh, the montage uh, but also I noticed that the uh, low linear frequency is at 1.6 hertz and the high band pass is 35 hertz. So yeah. it's relatively filtered. And so we have an average reference uh, yeah. and a filtered recording and just one montage. So this isn't the opportunity for us to drill down on, yeah. on yeah. nuance with respect to ictal discharge. Precisely. So we did uh, reduce for this uh, epic. I have taken 35 hertz as a higher. I should have kept it at 120 or 300. But more or less, there was some amount of artifact which was uh, coming in uh, in terms of noise. So I had to reduce it to 35. And ideally, I should have you know, had it at least at 300. And uh, that is something I do accept. And um, uh, after, uh, you know, removing that artifact, this is what uh, we found. Yeah. I do agree with the, the technical aspects. Yes. So uh, we will now go on to the next event. Uh, so this is the next event. And uh, she had several in the night. So So that's all the event was. It was very brief. And in fact, there were times when our team would discuss whether it's an event at all. <laughs> so, uh, but the mother was very persistent that these things are just happening again and again and do something about them. So she responds immediately. She starts answering. And uh, all she had is this, you know, slight jerking of the right lower limb and 
Then she has some non-integrated movements of the right upper limb, whether you want to call them automatisms or... So that's the right upper limb. They look very non-integrated, some kind of... Here it almost looks like, yeah, it looks like an automatism. So that's all the event is, and the mother is out to call the staff. Just, just on the point of the mother, Manjari, obviously the mum has a, a deep experience of her daughter's seizures, yes. and and obviously her radar is excellent. And I wonder about the combination of what we are seeing, which is obviously the right lower limb movement and some variable right and bilateral upper limb movements, as w whether the mother has other insights, including changes in facial expression or in looking on uh, a worried look on the patient's face, other semiology that, that can guide us from yeah. the mother. Yeah. So we, in fact, we repeatedly, um, my epilepsy fellow, uh, she also, as well as we, we repeatedly asked the mother, how do you know that the event is happening? Because it's so brief. She says when the event happens, uh, she moves her leg and then there is some movement of the eyes. So at one point of time, we were thinking, is it a REM sleep behavior phenomenon or is it, you know, um, uh, uh, unilateral periodic leg movements, which she's having. So all those thoughts went through our mind. But um, this uh, thing, the mother said she would pick up with the eyes moving around and not to any particular side, and uh, there would be a jerking of the right lower limb. And this would occur several times in the night, and she was disturbed in sleep. The mom couldn't sleep because the daughter was moving her right leg and jerking it again and again. So the mom picked up this, and there is no way anybody else could have picked it up because uh, we would have just passed it off as some kind of arousal phenomenon or maybe a unilateral periodic leg movement or a REM sleep behavior phenomenon. So, um, yeah, there were times when we did doubt whether it's ictal at all. May I ask one question? Yes. Uh, the, so far, uh, as you uh, definitely mentioned that the, the semiology as a seizure, if it is seizure, is the very mild. And then the, the, the fellows and then the uh, doctor in charge are very wondering that how that the mother noticed that it is the uh, reproducible event. So I just wondering that the, this, the uh, mild events happen with the appropriate dose of the medication. What the, what's happened yeah. to her uh, if they decrease the meds? Because sometimes the uh, seizure arising from the frontal lobe can become quickly large. Uh, as you said, that the, some of them uh, from the uh, focal to bilateral tonic cone seizures. So I just wondering that the, how was the uh, largest as the extent of the seizures type? So as I told you in the history, uh, the, when we asked for any events where she would be incontinent and shaking uh, very uh, violently, the mom said that uh, she used to have these events when out of frustration, uh, they would stop all the anti seizure medicines because nothing was working. Uh, so the bigger events where she would have tonic-clonic movements and be incontinent and bite her tongue would occur in sleep uh, when she was uh, when she was over several months she was without the medicine. So again, they would restart it. So like there would be periods of two months or three months where the, the parents would pull off the medicines and give her some. In India, there are all these uh, local people. Um, uh, we call them the Ayurvedic and, you know, some of these homeopathic and some. So they sometimes uh, the parents would stop the uh, allopathic drugs and go to the other parties and take their medication. And so um, when she was off her medication, um, the parents had no completely off it. The parents had noted uh, bigger events. Yes. But uh, we did not get them in the lab because the only medication which we tapered was levetiracetam and she had several several, several uh, clusters over two nights itself that uh, we didn't, uh, you know, want to taper the others just to produce a generalized seizure. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. One quick question. Tongue biting sometimes is informative because that the epistolatial tongue biting can happen uh, depending on that the laterality. I just wondering that the, uh, which side of the tongue was bitten by, by herself? Uh, I don't recollect having any particular side uh, being told by them. So um, I would not be able to comment on that. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, so another question, did the mother know when she had the convulsion? And uh, granted, this can be um, not not reliable when you don't have it on video, but uh, 
which way was the head version at the onset of the tonic clonic seizure? So, so the mother would say that uh, the head would mildly go to the left, but there was never like something very forced. So. Uh, or persistent, so that didn't come out even in the generalized tonic clonic. Uh, they would just say that she would shake under the bedclothes very violently, and uh, so that was uh, we didn't get any history of forced version as such from the parents here. Yeah. And the last seizure that you showed, I, I didn't see the first seizure we saw the leg sort of you know very slight tonic and then the uh, intortion of the foot. Um, I, I didn't see that with this one, but with other seizures, was that a consistent feature? Yes. So in all the events which she had, it was the right foot which would move first. And there would be this jerk followed by some sustained tonic. Um, and then the hand would move. Uh, and in this particular event, even both the hands move and it looks almost like an automatism. So all her events were very, very stereotyped. So what Just, one concern I would have is... Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. No, carry, carry on, Avery, isn't it? Okay. So the one concern I have is the important distinction here. It's a little hard to tell because her seizures are so subtle and so brief. Is it an automatism or is it some kind of mild motor, elementary motor sign? Um, so, and, so the yeah. initial right hand movement, I thought, was non-integrated motor movement. Um, but later on, she has both hands moving. So that is when I thought it is moving into an automatism and... Uh, I had a lot of difficulty trying to characterize her seizures. In fact, at one point of time, we thought uh, she doesn't have anything and let's just send her off. And I don't know, maybe it's just a sleep phenomenon. And we even had a polysomnogram done on her. Of course, that showed, again, the same, uh, you know, uh, ictal uh, patterns. And there was no evidence of any, uh, you know, high voltage delta in N3. It wasn't happening in N3 sleep to suggest a parasomnia. Uh, so, um, yeah. In fact, that, that was sorry. That was the point that I was going to make. Beyond the, uh, the these clearly are seizures, and if we were thinking of pa parasomnia, there are too many red flags that exclude that possibility. Firstly, she's having very frequent episodes in a single night that are incredibly brief without residual, which isn't characteristic of uh, uh, the parasomnias. Uh, the first couple of hours when she falls asleep. If that was a parasomnia, it would be a non-REM parasomnia, which tends to occur only once at night rather than clusters, and it, whether it be night terrors or sleepwalking or, or um, uh, a confusional arousals uh, rather than a REM sleep thing. So um, certainly the semiology screams out seizure rather than a, a sleep uh, disorder. Absolutely. So Dr. Dunn has very beautifully covered the difference between a seizure and a parasomnia, multiple events, very brief events, all occurring in the early part of sleep, uh, associated with normal mentation, no confusion, uh, uh, no walking out of the bed uh, phenomenon, uh, all would go in favor of seizures as, you know, frontal lobe seizures and parasomnia are a close differential. And uh, that is, uh, you know, what we were also, um, you know, ultimately uh, we, we concluded that these were all seizures. But then it, it took us a lot of time to kind of comprehend that they were very different from the very hypermotor seizures or SMA kind of seizures or, you know, uh, uh, chronic movements, which we typically see in a frontal lobe uh, phenomenology. So uh, that's why we went through the whole thing of thinking whether it could be something else than a CISA. And ultimately, we came to the conclusion uh, that uh, because of the multiplicity of events and clustering and brief brevity of the seizures, brevity of the episodes, they were all seizures. Could you hear me? Can I yes. make one um, brief comment? I essentially agree all of these kind of this uh, discussion. I would like to add one more point. Uh, throughout that the several events, I totally agree that the initial right foot uh, myoclonus or some the extension or the brief automatism-like activity is the very uh, impressive and then it's happened uh, presumably at the beginning. And the later the patient have some uh, right hand automatism-like movement or the bilateral hands uh, movement, so that's happened later. So uh, sometimes uh, we encounter the patient who shows that the, uh, the very fragmented SMS seizure uh, involving only the one side of the foot or the 
another side of the foot, and but the, at the same time, the, they are uh, the both hands are freely, uh, voluntarily moving. So I just wondering that the even in that the ICTA period, the patient's semiology may be restricted to that the right foot, whereas that the bilateral hands may be is still free from that the uh, seizure semiology. That could be the one possibility. That's what I uh, add some comments. Okay. I agree with Dr. Fida, is that, that the, the right lower extremity movement is um, very stereotyped and autonomous. So that does some suggest the medial or frontal parietal lobe. I mean, anytime I see something in the leg and the foot, I'm really thinking about the marginal ramus of the single sulcus. So either the anterior percutaneous or the posterior part of the parasensual lobule. And then also where that um, posterior part of the parasensual lobule, that sulcus, the marginal ramus of the single sulcus, that's where the post-central gyrus um, becomes medial as a Y. And so sometimes you get proximal arm at the same time. So I don't know if she has, you know, I'm making that assumption. There's a proximal movement there. The other thing too is that uh, in, in this patient, I was monitoring them. I would probably startle them while they're asleep, make a loud noise, maybe drop something uh, because that would be very helpful. Mesial frontal parietal seizures uh, can be induced by startle and that's fairly specific. Okay. So that, that would help to... Um, points in the direction. The other thing too is that some of you know this is kind of difficult when you're, you're lowering meds because you don't want to get a tonic chronic seizure. But sometimes if you lower the meds a little bit, you see the evolution of the semiology. When you see the evolution of the semiology, we might see that leg extend, or we see both legs extend. And then what happens is without going into tonic chronic seizure, and, and that would give further evidence of what this is. Or if it evolved into something else, it would sell granted it's not at the onset. But it tells us about the evolution of the genealogy, which gives us information about network connectivity. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So at the at the end of two days of multiple of these events, uh, during one of which we had the ICL spec being done, uh, we came to the conclusion that they were all Caesars. But hypothetically, we were unable to place uh, whether they were in which group they fell into in those four groups described by Bonini. Uh, they were definitely not elementary, uh, very, very elementary, clonic or tonic. There was some tonic component. There was some myoclonic component. Um, there were some non-integrated movements. Um, they were definitely not hypermotor. Uh, and they all look like they are just a mild arousal from sleep and then going back, uh, uh, though it was not sleep phenomenon. So uh, based on this, we definitely ruled out um, the group one and group two, and we tended to favor a group three or group four. We can discuss that later, but definitely a frontal loop origin. And since the tonic or myoclonic was on the right, we tended to err on to the left side. And uh, so let's go with the PG of this event. So uh, this is the second event which we had, and you can see the sleep spindles and <clears throat> again the same uh, the filter settings I'm sorry I have kept it at this because there was some peculiar artifact and I had to reduce it again to 35 here as Dr. John Dunn pointed out and here you see again the same um, same um, polymorphic delta uh, which comes in uh, onto the FP1, F7 um, and then uh, as she goes along, uh, you find this in this event, uh, the, the spiky activity which comes in much more pronounced um, in the left frontal as compared to the right uh, spike and wave uh, along the event, uh, as we can see here. And this is in the bipolar uh, montage. Uh, so this was the average, uh, go to the bipolar. We see she's sleeping, again, the same, uh, slowing polymorphic delta-like activity seen over the left, more than right. And then she goes along and then the spiky activity comes again um, with, you know, at FP1, spike and wave, spike and wave, spike and wave. So, uh, this is essentially what we found in her events and just put it on a Laplacian and try to look at it uh, again. 
So the spikes there on the left frontal. So very much uh, same and double banana. Yeah. So basically it's um, any comments on the EG, second uh, ickle EG? I, I totally agree with you. And then the uh uh, the toward the the the, the course of this the uh, activity, quite large amplitude spike was the uh, identified at the P one, so yes. that's uh, uh, the the occurring in the middle of the seizure. But I think it is the very important uh, the signal uh, saying that the this area uh, was actually some sort of the spilled out this the uh, epileptic activity. So thing is that the from somewhere, uh, the seizure is coming, but I get that the uh, the left uh, anterior quadrant uh, is some. It's very important uh, because that the initial colmorphic delta was also some sort of uh, <clears throat> the not the big, uh, beginning of the seizure, but the, something has happened in the 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 deep area. I guess, yeah. Yes, I think that's an excellent observation, Doctor Kida. That the initial. Uh, slow uh, delta, which we see, would indicate that it's coming from a deeper area and later on it spikes. So uh, we should not get misled by just uh, thinking that it's something which is really at FP1. It may be much more deeper than uh, the frontal pole. Uh, and Dr. Dunn, Dr. Um, Rasmo. I think that the uh, Dr. Rasmus, your voice is a bit um, faint uh, okay. because this is being recorded. We would want a strong voice because uh, okay. you know, no problem. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Better? Okay, sorry about that. Yes, I agree, Dr. that it's a left into a frontal quadrant, and as it evolves, it becomes more compelling with the uh, left um, you know, frontal swelling, particularly uh, anterior frontal swelling. Uh, and then the um, the spike in wave. So that's uh, um, you know what's interesting is that the semiology is not. Uh, I mean the semiology is pretty bland, but um, it, it doesn't entirely fit. Um, um, well, it, it does fit and doesn't fit because I'm still not sure what the right foot movement represents. That an automatism or some other thing. Certainly, with seizures coming from orbital frontal or prefrontal early on, there may be very little semiology. You only see the semiology once it propagates. To another region. Okay. Dr. Dunn? I just completely agree with Akio and Erasmo to say that we know that this is pointing to the left anterior quadrant and that's the limitation of surface EEG. Okay. So uh, with this much information, um, we then went, uh, as I told you, she had an, had an ickle spec during, um, uh, I just wanted to uh, have an opinion. Of course, the filters are, it's kind of filtered, but how would you comment on this uh, rhythmic activity here, uh, Dr. Erasmo, Dr. Dunn? Uh, this is before this slow activity. There seems to be a faster kind of, not, I mean, it's like maybe theta range activity here. Uh, would you give that any significance, or uh... if if um, it's kind of subtle, but as we know, if it's, okay. if it's something subtle, but we see it with every single seizure, then we okay. know that it's something real. If it's yeah. uh, so you don't see it in every uh, every event here. So um, so this was her ictal uh, spect, uh, which you saw in the first event. She the staff was injecting her during the event. Uh, and this is where it uh, localized. Um, it was a huge blob, which was seen. Um, and this is a ciscos, uh, not the ciscom. So it was localizing to the left basifrontal um, area. So we did have a clue in this. And uh, we then went ahead with the MRI. So I'm just showing you. Uh, she had several MRIs. She, in fact, had three MRIs with us because every time uh, the MRI was discussed, um, you know, people thought it was normal. The radiologist reported it, it is normal, and it went on and on. So uh, if you want me to halt anywhere, I would. So any comments on this particular section? Manjari. 
Yeah. Uh, this is Kawaii. The, how about uh, the uh, bottom, uh, the most light, uh, the uh, slice? Uh, this one? Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, the, so gyration pattern is a normal. Uh, the, you, so you can uh, see. Left side. Yeah. yeah on the, so I'm just, uh, for comparison, the right is here. So you see beautifully the white matter, gyrus rectus. But here you see that this is disintegrated and the left basifrontal. But it may be difficult to comment, isn't it? Because you can see the sylvan fissure on the other side. So it's not exactly an axial section. There could be some mm -hmm. tilt. Any other uh, comments? Like if you look at the image on the right and the upper part, uh, do you see any difference? Could you actually zoom it if you don't mind, Manjari? Can I you zoom? How to zoom it? How do I you zoom? Have, it? You have a slider on the PowerPoint, so you can just slide it up. Is it possible? Uh, Manjari, if you have a coronal. So yeah, yeah I do have yeah. a coronal, so I'll go to the coronal. Yeah. So this is the coronal. Anything? Any comments? So could you enlarge uh, the the image? I'm not uh, able uh, to enlarge it. I don't know why. Shrat, how do I? Because this is just on the slide. It's not the video. Okay. There is a zoom option below. If you move. Uh, if you move your arrow to the lower part of the lower and left corner of the zoom, there you have a magnifying glass. Maybe you can try that. At least it's coming here. But I suppose a, anybody could, you know, even I could zoom it. I'm able to zoom it. So I can zoom it individually on my screen. Okay. So, um, so basically, uh, you know, we had a tough time uh, trying to decide if there's anything uh, in these images, though we could have a syscos. Uh, so this is just the 3D T1. And so going back actually to the flare images, the uh, okay. coronal flare. And then bear, bearing in mind, of course, this uh, yeah, you could bias, uh, so I'm going very slowly. So, yeah, start. Sure. there's a sulcus there in the inferior frontal lobe. Um, just keep on going back. Um, again, so you're talking about this, so, yeah. So, no, so no, no. So, if we go look at the bottom part, look at the and then as we're starting. And you know, it could be volume averaging, so maybe nothing. So to just lateral to where your pointer was, uh, sort of like in the lateral orbital cortex, right there, and look at the next yep. slice, and then look to the far right slice. There's a, uh, and then there's just a sulcus. That sulcus is too deep. See that there? Okay. We don't see it on the other side. I'm assuming, uh, I mean, it's maybe a little asymmetric because we see the poles that look a little different, but that just that sulcus looks uh, deeper. Um, you know. I think as you go further back, when you get to the partial triangularis, it looks thick, but that's not really real. Um, but that sulcus there looks a little strange. Um, and particularly it's thick at the bottom of the sulcus, particularly if you look at the left upper image. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, so you know, it would be important to, you know, um, do multiplanar reformatting to see if it pans out on the other slices, uh, that that's something abnormal or not. Okay. Uh, anybody else, Doctor uh, Ikida, Doctor Dan? Uh, can I make some comments of this? The right up uh, uh, the corona MRI. Uh huh. 
the relatively large white matter may be a little bit blurred for me. Uh, may I may I write something? Yes. Uh, yes. What I'm talking is that this part may be a little bit uh, uh, the high intensity as opposed to that the other side, but I don't know. It is just a matter of. Uh, uh, the recording condition. Could you see my the uh, uh, red square? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So there is a difference in intensity of the white matter between the right and the left. That is what. Yeah, the but it, it may be just a matter of that the MRI recording condition. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So I'll just go ahead with uh, all the images because we have several in her and. Uh, anything on this? Anybody would like to comment on? Uh, one comment that I'd like to make is that we know we're biased, of course. We've seen the semiology, we've seen the EEG, and um, and we've seen the ictal spect. And that bias, um, once the neuroradiologists have had a blinded look, uh, we try and ask them, find us a lesion, <laughs> find us a lesion in the left anterior head. And, the, and, then, the, and and sometimes if, they help, and sometimes they do uh, with their clever eyes. And and I think the biggest bias is the topic of the today's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, so we had a tough time uh, trying to figure out where what was, and she had several imaging uh, done over you know a three year period that she followed on before we could put in. Um, uh, a, a clear hypothesis and operator. So I'm just going to scro scroll through these uh, rather fast. Uh, but again, I would like to, uh, you know, indicate here that you can see the white matter very beautifully. Whereas here, everything looks very mushed up and it's like a blob out here with white matter just going in two directions. And so this, this was the only finding we got and um, this is just to show that, you know, it was reported as normal. And then she had another imaging uh, one year later, which was again reported as normal, though we discussed it over several years. So then she had another imaging where they said the left anterior nasal temporal is abnormal. But then we had an ASL on her. So this is the arterial spin labeling. And um, again, if you look at it, of course, our hypothesis was frontal. So... Um, there is a little bit more of uh, hyperperfusion in the left PC frontal in the ASL. So uh, that, that was that finding is interesting. Can you show the actual uh, suggestion? That... Uh, I don't have the uh, I don't have the coronal in this. I just have this uh, ancient. No, no, this is good. No, this is sorry. This is happening. So yeah. the idea that when it comes to all the hyper. So. Um, so we went and, ahead and did a meg for her, and the meg showed some uh, spikes in. Manjali, the before this, before this, could you show the magnified MRI images? Uh, yeah. So in this image, I don't know if it's clear to you all. Uh, as you can see, the white matter reaches to the base over here, but here, the white matter is kind of truncated at this level, and this looks like a blob here. So, again, if you look at this. Uh, the white matter is in five directions, like an amoeba here, and there's a blob here. So our uh, we were we were kind of zooming on, on to this basic frontal area, and of course we were biased with the ictal spect and ciscos. So even the coronal section, could you show it? One just <clears throat> go back a bit. Yeah, after this. Coronal, I don't have. Yeah, this yeah, one. this one. This one. Uh, it's not running, Sharat. I don't know for what reason. So. I don't have the whole thing. No, you could sh just show that image. That's okay. So even here, you could make out that the basic uh, frontal area, the gray matter looks definitely much more thicker. Of course, it's it's a very, very significant bias that we have. So the MEG uh, uh, showed a, a cluster with uh, the Esloretta ECD modeling at the left BC frontal. So here left is left. And there seems to be some projection towards the supplementary motor areas over here. So this was the finding in the MEG. This was the PET. So the PET clearly, you know, it gave us more confidence showing this huge blob of hypermetabolism. 
which was definitely seen in the left BC frontal area. So <clears throat> with this, we now, went ahead. Manjari, can I ask a question here to the faculty? Yes. yes. So my question is uh, directed to uh, George and of course, Dr. Rasma and also others that if you had these findings, how many of you would be confident to go in and do a direct surgery and rather not go with the CG? Because we have an MRI which on a second look maybe shows something there, but we have a strong concordance with the SPECT, PET as well as the ASL. So do we actually need to do SCG? And this question is particularly relevant in this forum because we are addressing many countries who may not have an access to SCG. So Rasma, I'll jump in. Uh, Sarat, that's a great question. Um, you know, I am biased. Um, I want more data, more information uh, before jumping into, uh, you know, a resective uh, procedure. So I would advocate for a stereo EEG. Now, you know, we, we have the resources available to us to perform that. If you don't, uh, that would uh, put you to do a resective surgery. Um, you may. Uh, I'm just not 100% convinced uh, uh, personally yet. Dr. Kawai? Yes, uh, the, like this uh, case, is, uh, the, I always uh, present uh, the uh, options uh, to uh, patients and the parents, uh, the, you know, the one-step surgery using uh, the intraoperative echo and uh, the uh, two-step uh, uh, surgery, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the intracranial uh, the evaluation. And I think uh, the, if the resource is limited, uh, we can go uh, directly uh, to the one-step surgery because of the uh, CISCOM uh, uh, SPECT uh, finding and MRI uh, finding. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, it is better we can get, uh, you know, uh, more uh, confident uh, the evidence uh, they're using intracranial uh, precise collaboration. But uh, uh, in some situations, uh, the, uh, we can go uh, the, uh, the uh, directory uh, one-step surgery. So before Manjari presents the CG, I would like to just add a few words that when we do a CG in our center, you know, because there is always this financial constraint, we like to put as little as CG leads as possible. And again, that's based on a very strong hypothesis. And the whole idea of a CG is to prove a hypothesis rather than to create a hypothesis. And in this case, for instance, as a surgeon, I wanted to know, is the basic frontal area epileptogenic. And if I had that information, we could always go and tailor the resection as per the electrocorticography. So you can see that uh, we have placed only uh, five SCG leads. Now, uh, once Manjari finishes showing the leads, I will ask this question to all the faculty here, whether you agree with this leads or how many more leads you would like to place in your center. So Manjari, you can... So this is the insula lead, which we, which we placed to 16 contact leads, a basic frontal lead. Now the areas, what you see red are the areas which are spiking, which are, you know, from where we recorded spontaneous seizures. This is the left hippocampus, left amygdala, again, negative. We didn't find anything. So she had a similar seizure because of lack of time, I would not be showing it. And uh, you can see here that she had the, this is uh, the insula and the red is the left BC frontal and the rest is the hippocampus and the amygdala. So uh, Manjari, could you minimize your screen? I mean, your screen, at least for me, is occupying you know, the whole screen. I'm not able to see the full screen at one. So I don't know how it works. I don't know how I would minimize it. It's right. just the PowerPoint. Yeah. So I think it's on your screen that you might be zoomed in still. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm this sorry. was the uh, this was the onset, and uh, this was the progression with low voltage, fast activity, uh, predominantly around mm, the uh, basi front basi frontal as well as the mid in, uh, anterior insula, as you can see. She had several events uh, which were very, very similar. So, 
So these were our findings on uh, the SEG, uh, which were confirmed uh, by stimulation. Uh, the seizures, uh, she had a similar seizure when we stimulated the basifrontal uh, electrodes, particularly six to eight. Now in this, even though we say insular channels, we actually have placed an oblique insular leads. So the areas which were positive on insular leads were actually the superior portion of the basifrontal. They were not actually insular. So you can see here. You know, they're not strictly insular leads. So when we analyzed it in the coronal section, they were just the superior most portion of the basic frontal. So our you mean the uppermost? Uppermost. Sorry, so uh, uh, can I ask something? Yes. Uh, the, you know, this this red part uh, is uh, uh, connected uh, to the, you know, deep sulcus uh, the Dr. Uh, Erasmo uh, pointed out, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is probably the upper uh, edge of that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And as when we saw the uh, the, the MRI that had the neck, it's, it's that posterior orbital cortex, that granular portion, and and that area is tightly connected to the uh, the insula uh, and also the temporal pole and amygdala, that that a granular posterior orbital cortex. Um, yes. Yes. So. Uh, this was what we found in the basifrontal uh, electrodes. And uh, she underwent a basifrontal uh, resection with a little bit of extension. Uh, yeah, so this was basically her post op um, MR uh, CT. Yeah. And uh, she had FCD type 1, uh, which was seen in our histopathology by our pathologists. So, uh, she has been seizure free and uh, the mom has put her in uh, online schooling, which is an open schooling system uh, as of now. And she comes periodically for follow up. Currently, her medication is being tapered. So uh, that's that's all I have uh, for today's case. And uh, the dilemmas we faced was uh, trying to localize where the seizures are. A lateralization we thought we could do, but we were not able to localize. We were in a dilemma where it was coming from. The clue uh, which we got was mostly from the CISCOS, and then we kind of had a bias towards that area, and uh, we did the MEG, we did the PET, and uh, the MRI, and then uh, we had uh, very minimal SEG electrodes. Of course, we couldn't uh, put as many placements as we would like to see the whole network because of cost issues. Uh, the SEG electrodes uh, are expensive, and uh, most of our electrodes are, uh, uh, you know, uh, given free from a research protocol. So we have to be very, very judicious with their use so that we can maximize over many patients. So, um, so I'd conclude the case, and I would welcome comments from Dr. Rasmo, Dr. Dunn, Dr. Ikida. And of course, yeah. Dr. George Jallo. Yeah. Dr. Kawai. My, yes. my, question yeah. to, my question to surgeons here is that uh, how many more electrodes would you have placed in your center? I know that in many centers, you would place considerably many more electrodes. But in this case, for instance, you have a very strong hypothesis. The SPECT is very strongly positive. PET is positive. The ASL shows some uh, activity there. The MRI is suspicious. So uh, we were just trying to prove the hypothesis, but in your case, yes, we'll be very interested to hear how we would plan your SCG. Typically, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so typically, you know, obviously there are challenges when there aren't resources, and so then you have to be very um, judicious in the resources that you use. Um, but if, if one has you know, more abundant resources, it's always good to, even when there's a... Um, um, then there's a subtle lesion, and if and we're vocalizing by the by the imaging, we 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 would typically we like to go uh, above, below, in front, and back of the lesion, and then other parts of the network is what we would typically do if uh, you know when when resources are more abundant. You know, obviously, other countries don't have all those resources, so you have to be more judicious in terms of um, what you can um, um, implant. Uh, you did an excellent job in this case, because to be honest with you, if you didn't have those frontal spikes, the semiology was so bland, it would be very hard to um, localize or even lateralize this case, for that matter. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the interrectal discharges help, and then the, the PET uh, 
and the arterial spin labeling were quite compelling. And then you can go back to the MRI and kind of see that posterior orbital cortex that is, um, um, shows that uh, cortical thickening. What's very unusual is now clearly orbital frontal seizures can be, if they stay in the orbital frontal region and don't go anywhere, they can be very bland. And actually, they have no symptoms. Claudia Minari described that, um, I believe Claudia Minari described that many years ago. But what's very odd is typically with seizures beginning there, they, they usually spread to the cingulate, the pole, and the patients have autonomic symptoms. So it, it is quite interesting that her seizures remained so bland and uh, didn't really um, spread to, uh, I'm clear it spread to the input, but didn't uh, uh, produce a more dramatic semiology. Uh, Dr. Jello, uh, you yeah. have comments? You know, I would agree. I mean, Srat, you bring up a great question. I think, you know, you, 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 depending upon the region and the resources available, I think as Erasmus said, we probably would have tripled the number of coverage, uh, that you had placed in her. Um, uh, you know, as Erasmus mm -hmm. highlighted, we'd want to get above, below, you know, ensuring that we have an adequate margin around the uh, locus, um, uh, of, of, you know, or the ictus uh, driving the seizures. Uh, and it, I guess it helps us, uh, you know, during the surgical resection. Um, we probably would have added an intraoperative EEG as well after resecting. So I think, again, um, it really, um, a lot of it depends upon the resources available uh, in the location that you are uh, in. But uh, we, we want more information than less. Keep it simple. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we did do an intraoperative electrocorticography. Um, I do have the EPEX, but uh, oh. because of the time issue. So we generally, even after the SEG implantation, the resection is done uh, under the ECOG, uh, you know, guidance. Yeah, and during the ECOG, we saw fast activity uh, coming on the grids, and uh, we resected accordingly. Yeah, yeah so about one question. Uh, the about uh, intraoperative uh, ECOG. So the, you know, the, the preoperative focus uh, suggested by the uh, 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 specs and M MRI uh, uh, looked uh, more lateral. Uh, but uh, uh, Sawat, your resection uh, 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 very limited to the medial part of orbital frontal. So how was uh, uh, the result of the interoperable equal? So, so no discharge from the lateral part of uh, orbital frontal area? Yeah, so typically it was done on the surface and then, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, base is difficult to put the grid, but wherever the resection margin was going based on uh, the uh, basic frontal area, which is where we thought the abnormality was, uh, around that uh, the ECOG was put here. Yeah. So yes, so in this case, we put the ECOG on the base also. And uh, after this amount of resection, we had normalization of the ECOG, which was very satisfactory. So I was actually expecting a much more wider area to be resected. Mm -hmm. But then the ECOG, you know, came to grade one very nicely and we didn't see any background activity. It was quite satisfactory. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ikeda, Dr. Dan. Yeah, look, I, you know, I think uh, Manjari, uh, Surat, you've done a wonderful job and I can only echo what uh, George and Erasmo have said that we, um, in a subtle or, or particularly lesion negative person, um, once the functional imaging, and I include EEG and MEG as a part of that, gives us a target zone, trying to get more information to try and determine uh, the epileptogenic region is very reassuring to us. Um, and uh, limited coverage means the possibility of, of edge phenomena and, and not actually seeing uh, where things are but then it's too expensive and and you've shown that in a limited resource situation you can get on with it and help people in a way that nothing but surgery uh, can um the other thing back to the um uh, uh, broad coverage um stereo has actually given us a window into the semiology of these kind of cases uh as has already been mentioned, uh, given the um, 
uh, mesial orbital frontal uh, uh, involvement, uh, a fearful facial expression or some other emotional features or other semiological features may have been more common. Um, but um, the more extensive stereo allows the network to be interrogated and for us to get a, it's like an exploration of how does this girl's semiology fit? And uh, with extensive stereo, we'd learn more about the nature of the spread of uh, her seizure network. And that is, uh, if you like, uh, pioneering stuff like at Marseille and John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland, other big centers where stereo is, is uh, extensively used and we're learning more about semiology because of stereo. Thank you. Could you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. <clears throat> Let me clarify one thing. I certainly understand that the epileptogenic area was located at the uh, major basal frontal. And then the what about the final the decision, final judgment of the insula? Insula in itself is the, also the epileptogenic, or the, it is just a matter of that the the uh, activity uh, spreading from that the base uh, basal frontal. What is your uh, final decision? Uh, so uh, the insula itself was insular um, electrode contacts itself are not uh, uh, playing any mischief. But the ones which were going anteriorly to the upper edge of that sulcus, which uh, uh, Dr. Rasmo showed showed us, uh, those were the ones which uh, showed the events during stimulation as well as spontaneously. So uh, we believe that the insula was not. Uh, epileptogenic by itself, but was probably involved uh, in the network. Um, and the placement of the electrode was such that it was actually a representation of the upper edge of the uh, deep sulcus, uh, aberrant sulcus. Yeah, thank you very much. So if it is so, uh, from that the neurologist's point of view, the, the number of the electrodes was the, uh, totally depends on that the, how that the neurosurgeon finally decided to reject to decide to decide it at the extent uh, of the area, <clears throat> so uh, that the uh, that more that the the decided uh, uh, the epileptogenic area, uh, the <clears throat> the more electrodes should be the uh, informative. But at the same time, uh, the depending on that the neurosurgeon decision uh, uh, as to uh, uh, the, the extent of the area. So. Uh, I respect that the, all the, uh, the pre-surgical decision or the uh, some the planning of the neurosurgeon. So that's that's my comment. Thank you very much. I, I have a comment. You, you really did an excellent job with your imaging. Uh, and I think it goes back to, you, of course, you look at semiology, it's very important, make a hypothesis, but Im it's really you know, imaging, imaging, imaging. We know that when you can, when you have a clearer hypothesis with the imaging, and certainly with the PET, and then going back to the MRI and the SPEC and the MEG, really help. And and what happens is, even with SCG, you're limited. If the electrode's only 0.8 millimeters in diameter. So, you know, um, you, you can put in, in somebody, if you don't have adequate imaging, you can put in 20 electrodes, not that we'd ever put in 20 electrodes, but, and still not get it, because we, SEG electrode can only uh, see activity within a centimeter, um, and each electrode is only 0.8 millimeters in diameter. So really being judicious about where those electrodes are placed and really the imaging. So really, your imaging was really key, and that helped find the abnormality. You know, without that imaging, unfortunately, you know, let's say this was, you have the spikes, but there's some of these basal frontal cases that have no intricate discharges. And so then you have to, and the, the semiology wasn't necessarily, you know, uh, incredibly helpful. Um, and so the imaging really helped out um, very significantly. Thank you. I think putting it all together is uh, something which, uh, you know, uh, helped us in this case. So I'd hand over to Dr. Chandra. So thank you. Yes, we did cross over the time, but I think the case was interesting. And we have plenty of time, so that's okay. Uh, so now uh, I will request Professor Rasmo to give his lecture on the preoperative evaluation for basic frontal epilepsy. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay. All right. Um, 
got a lot of information. I'll try to be um, relatively brief. I'm going to show my screen here. All right, so we're talk about evaluation of the basal frontal uh, epilepsy, um, orbital frontal into frontal epilepsy. And uh, what we're going to discuss is, um, as we already discussed, like the case was excellent because it, uh, um, it actually um, illustrates uh, many of the points that I'll be discussing. Um, so understanding frontal lobe network and usefulness for localization, uh, recognize key semiologic features, uh, correlating MRI epilepsy protocol imaging uh, and functional imaging with clinical features as um, you did in that case, uh, understanding uh, frontal anatomy, um, and then um, knowing the functional subdivisions of the inferior frontal lobe and its connectivity, uh, and then know the pearls and pitfalls of localization, and then know when stereogy is um, helpful or maybe not helpful. And, and certainly, uh, as uh, Don said, the stereogy is really revolutionized how we handle these cases because uh, um, our threshold for using invasive monitoring is lower than it was when you had to do a, a subdural grid before. Um, so, semiology is very key, um, and uh, semiology coming from the Greek meaning a sign, and really helps to guide us and point us. It doesn't necessarily tell us that, oh, that's the spot, but, but it tells us about the network, so it gives us an overview, and then it helps us look at the imaging and then correlate uh, that with the structural and functional imaging. It's not uncommon. We look at the imaging, uh, the MRI, numerous times, and we don't see anything. Um, and then when we look at the semiology and then look at the PET, then or spec that helps find that subtle bottom of the sulcus dysplasia or, or maybe um, aberration in the gyral anatomy. Uh, so here's a, uh, uh, again, we always have to be aware that we all have cognitive biases and, and we, and I know for myself, I get enamored with my hypothesis uh, and that but my hypothesis may be wrong. So then um, my colleagues are helpful to keep me honest, uh, realizing that I'm being myopic and um, um, not thinking about alternate possibilities. So as you can see here, um, you know, just think what you see. Um, so depending on how you look at it, sometimes it also depends on the context. So if you say, you know, um, uh, carrots, you might see a rabbit, uh, or, or if you say quacking or something, um, you might see a duck. Um, and so again, sometimes we, um, our minds make us see what we want to see based on our biases. So sometimes we want to walk away from a case or, uh, and that's why we have a multidisciplinary conference for other people to keep us honest and look at other things that we may have potentially missed. So we look at inferior frontal network, uh, there's a prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is oftentimes neglected, even when we do SEG investigations. Um, because looking at the broadening areas nine and ten, uh, nine the medial, the ventral medial, and then uh, ten more laterally, and then the orbital frontal cortex and its subdivisions, uh, the anterior middle frontal gyrus, um, the inferior frontal gyrus, harsh triangularis, uh, the subgenual cingulate, ventral anterior cingulate, paracingulate, temporal pole, and then the uh, anterior insula. And these are areas are all quite interconnected. Uh, and also, I would even add to this even the um, um, amygdala. And as we look at this, so if we look to the right, uh, the orbital frontal cortex uh, consists of like an H, uh, and then you've got the posterior orbital cortex, and the posterior part of the orbital cortex is uh, kind of primitive cortex, agranular, and very tightly connected to the ventral anterior insula, the temporal pole, and the amygdala. And then you've got the lateral orbital cortex, which is broad area 12, the uh, anterior orbital cortex, which is 11, which is very tightly connected to the prefrontal cortex, and then the medial orbital gyrus, which is also <clears throat> a granular uh, broadening area 14. Uh, but it's, it's really contiguous, contiguous with the insula, as you can see there. And as we look at the basal frontal lobe, um, so MOG being medial orbital gyrus, anterior orbital gyrus, posterior orbital gyrus, and lateral uh, orbital gyrus. But if you look here, th so this is looking at the uh, ventral insula, and so here's the apex of the insula where all the uh, gyri kind of meet. All right. And then you see the pole of the insula here. Uh, and then the uh, kind of hidden underneath almost where the alignment insula is, um, the transverse insular gyrus. And so I think like we are seeing in that case is that it's so tightly interconnected that um, um, you can see spikes in there. I mean, they can um, be almost time-locked with the other spikes, except they may be of lower amplitude. 
Um, and again, this speaks to the network. And then the temporal pole, which is removed here, is also um, uh, tightly connected to that um, um, via certain fibers and also the internet particulars. And then when we look at the, um, so I'm just going to go through different regions that are connected to the overall frontal cortex. So this is just one study uh, and there are many others. Uh, but just looking at the functional connectivity of the, uh, the insula. So when we look here in the, um, uh, at the apex of the insula that's in red, and then also you've got the, uh, um, the uh, dorsal uh, anterior insula in uh, orange that you can look at the, when you look at to the left, and look at my arrow here, you know, very tightly connected to that uh, orbital frontal uh, and lateral frontal cortex. Um, so seizures come from this region will propagate there or vice versa. Um, and so when we do these explorations, particularly in non-lesional cases, that uh, mapping out the network uh, and knowing the connectivity is really crucial. And then this is just showing the lateral surface. So here you can see the, the, the lateral prefrontal cortex uh, 10, and then uh, um, the um, prefrontal frontal gyrus uh, kind of lateral immediately, uh, the um, uh, pre um, uh, broaden area 9. And then the anterior part, if you look at the back part of the middle frontal gyrus, so that's really obviously premotor. When you go anterior, it's really um, you, you, it's part of the prefrontal cortex. And then here's the lateral part of the orbital cortex, and here's the anterior part of the partial triangularis. And the reason why I point this out is that when we think about orbital frontal epilepsy, that what happens is that they propagate to these regions, or, or lesions in this region can actually mimic it. But it is important to recognize in Claudia Minari, um, um, late Claudia Minari, this um, unbelievable from uh, Nagardi and Milan, uh, showed with many studies that when the seizures remain isolated in the orbital frontal cortex, that's actually no, really no clinical symptoms. It's only once it spreads elsewhere, particularly to the singular, that you have a hypermotor behavior, or when it spreads to the temporal lobe, that you start to see some of the other uh, features like the autonomic type um, symptoms. And then here, I just look to the right here. So again, looking at the cingulate, and the cingulate's also tightly connected to these regions. So we look at the, the subgenual cingulate, area 25, the ventral anterior cingulate. Um, you can get autonomic symptoms or sometimes vocalization or facial expressions. When you get to the dorsal anterior cingulate, where I'm pointing here, um, you can get axial body churning uh, along the horizontal axis or rocking back and forth. Um, but the key thing is what, what the patient does early on. <clears throat> Again, it doesn't necessarily mean to see you begin there, but it points to the, to, the, to the network. And again, I want to emphasize one area that we oftentimes miss is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is tightly connected to the orbital region and even the medial temporal lobe. Um, so it's always important to always uh, consider the prefrontal uh, cortex. Uh, and then also another area to uh, consider, I don't mean to confuse it with this busy slide here, but is the temporal pole. So the temporal pole obviously begins an anterior temporal lobe and then ends at the Lyman insula and uh, and the laterally where the where the um, superior temporal sulcus begins. And it's a very important integrative in, area that that feeds to many other regions. And so parts of the um, of the uh, temporal pole connect to the orbital frontal cortex uh, and also the lateral inferior frontal cortex. So you can see like the area um, that these are monkey areas, uh, TA. And then also you can see here um, the um, um, different subdivisions of the temporal pole um, variably uh, project to the uh, frontal cortex and also other regions as well. And also the medial uh, frontal cortex. So always consider the temporal pole when exploration uh, because of that connectivity. And these seizures, uh, as you know, can spread quite quickly. And, and with with SEG, we'll only find these, um, or we can be misled, but we'll only see EG onsets with the electrodes. Uh, obviously, when we're looking at EG onsets, we're looking, we know we're close to the generator. We have what's in periodic spikes, which we typically see in SEG type 2. And then if we see, obviously, low voltage gas activity or periodic spikes that precede the clinical symptomatology. And also understanding short, uh, frontal lobe uh, connections, uh, white matter connectivity that also helps us. So this is, uh, we're not going to go through this, but this, I just wanted to illustrate the complexity of the connectivity. Uh, so just within the frontal lobe, um, there's a uh, numerous connectivity 
so you know, prefrontal cortex can uh, shoot right over to this to the cingulate and produce a cingulate semiology. The same is true for the orbital frontal cortex. Um, and so understanding uh, white matter connectivity is also helpful in terms of uh, mapping out the um, the network. And certainly, um, as um, Don said, that you know, SEG has really revolutionized what uh, we've been able to do. Granted, SEG has been around for um, a while, um, mostly used in Europe, um, and then using the semiologic approach going back to the days of uh, Pyrock and Claudio Minari. And then this is the uh, uh, paper that Manzari was referring to, a fairly classic paper, very good paper by uh, Francesca Bonini and Eileen McGonigal. Uh, and so they, they looked at four different uh, types. So uh, there's the uh, elementary motor signs, which typically are the pre-central pre-motors, so that would be like chronic jerking, um, and uh, uh, of a distal limb or proximal limb. And then um, group two, um, involving pre-motor regions, uh, elementary motor signs, non-integrated, typically they're unnatural postures, as you see with SMA, so asymmetric chronic posturing, uh, due to the abrupt and onset. So, you know, clearly this patient wasn't really group one or two. We, the case I was presented, just because of the questionable chronic movement of the, the leg, uh, one could argue that was group one, but clearly it was not group one based on what we learned about the, the case. Um, and then, um, Group three, uh, so integrated uh, gestural motor behavior. So it might be rocking, touching the face, uh, you know, uh, distal stereotypies, uh, uh, um, which can point like to a network involving the prefrontal region. And then when you think about the paralimbic region, which is actually the group four would be this case, except the patient didn't have the semiologic features. And I think for some reason, this patient seeing did not. Um, uh, propagate in a large network. But if you see fearful behavior, fearful expression, autonomic signs and symptoms, then you kind of think that it's a network involving the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, anterior temporal structures, and the amygdala. And we do these implantations, we get very humbled because what happens is we see the discharges. And so we had a case, uh, a, a young girl at, um, at our center, and we, um, uh, and there was no lesion. And so and the season began in the temple pole and the amygdala on the left. And then within a couple of seconds was the anterior insula and also then spread to the consulateral side. Now, fortunately, we had 24 seasons and 23 out of 24 began in that temple pole and still kind of early see, um, um, our group of their reception was uh, 12 year old and she's in the season of April. But really, the semiology and the imaging is not particularly helpful. Maybe there's a little bit of how about metabolism in the funnel, I mean, in the um, temple pole. But that was about it. No dysplasia, um, what you could see. And then this is just uh, showing the, uh, um, I won't go through this, but I, I do highly recommend looking at the paper by Benini and uh, Eileen McGonigal uh, going through this. This is, I think this should be quite helpful when uh, uh, trying to analyze the work of uh, frontal epilepsy uh, and uh, pretty overall frontal epilepsy. Uh, and as you illustrated in your case, and I, I think this is really an important point that even in um, countries that don't have the resources, the SEG electorate is very, very expensive, uh, as you know. And so you really have to be very judicious. But really, the uh, if you have really good imaging and your, your MRI is superb, it's a biometric MRI, follows the ILE protocol, you do the MRI, you do the PET, uh, you do MRI PET fusion, statistical parametric mapping, MEG, Take this back in, and that really helped you in this this case um, significantly. So Im it's really imaging, imaging, imaging. So again, not imaging in isolation, so they can find find the lesion that may not be real. Uh, but when you correlate it and look at the um, the whole package, it's helpful. I'm just going to share a piece here with you. Um, hope I'm not going over. Am I okay on time? Uh, yes, yes, please, please. We would like to see your case. Okay. So this is a 43-year-old uh, right-handed woman with history of seizures since age eight. She felt numerous as In 2010, she told she was told that she had psychogenic seizures. And she has an aura with a feeling of dread, and her heart would race, and she would feel somewhat paranoid. Uh, she was so scared that she would not want to move. Uh, her uh, mother says they last 20 or 30 seconds. Does not recall what she has been told. This is domestic. 
and she may say she's sorry, um, and she feels embarrassed, and then she kisses her mother after the seizure, and her head may turn to the left, but uh, it's actually non because it's kind of a curse of just kind of a glance. But um, so I've seen this patient in clinic, and her um, her partner showed me a video of her seizure, which I'll show you in a moment, okay, which actually helped tremendously. But anyway, during her seizure, she frowns and has a blank stare, and she may smack her lips. So I'm going to, unfortunately, I was not able to uh, integrate the video uh, into my slide. It didn't work, so I'm going to stop sharing and show you the video here, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, Jignesh, could you help? Yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm I'm, I'm just going to reshare a different. Uh, I had a um, to show the video. It didn't integrate into my um, but uh, I'm going to share it right now. Right, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. And you can see um, uh, that frown or pouting, so we call it ictal pouting. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to go back to my slides here. All right, so we're going to, um, I guess I'm going to give you more details about the case. Um, I won't go through, we, you're already aware of the imaging because they're well illustrated in the case that was presented earlier. Um, and so this, uh, so th this patient has the chapeau gendarme, this described by Francine Chasseau, uh, and involves a network involving the uh, anterior cingulate, uh, where there's this uh, frowning. And then uh, this is um, this is from uh, Francine's paper um, showing the regions. So not, not only necessarily beginning the syndrome, but involving a network and involving the ventral anterior syndrome, as you can see by the uh, yellow, red, and purple dots. So in this patient, we so she had um, um, and no one's rectal activity, maybe some left temple slowing. And he, she had been seen in another center and was told that maybe she had left temple epilepsy. Now, I, I can see why they thought that, because she had one atypical event out of sleep, where she aroused and had left temple rhythmic theta, uh, but that was not the chapeau de Um And so we did the uh, uh, ictal spec, and you can see this uh, um, hyperperfusion uh, here in the, uh, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex. And then we looked, now I... I I initially missed this lesion until we did the spect, and then you can see the uh, the bottom of the cell with dysplasia with the tail in here, and then here, and that you kind of go into the paracingulate, and then here on the T1, and then here. Uh, so in, in that in this case here, we so Again, it goes back to that question, do you need SCG to have this lesion here? Now, one reason why we elected on SCG is because she had the um, mm -hmm. um, that one event at another center, which I actually reviewed, and it uh, uh, looked like there was something in the left temple region. Uh, but clearly, this unequivocally, this is um, you know, a type 2B dysplasia, which actually pathologically is a type 2B dysplasia. But, but we implanted her temporal lobes just based on that, that seizure that was captured at another center. And much to our surprise, I mean, clearly this was a dysplastic lesion. We could simulate seizures from there, no question. But even though she had no seizures come from her temporal lobe, her temporal lobe showed very frequent spikes, almost like in someone who had hippocampal epilepsy, um, which I think speaks to that even a lesion like this can affect the temporal lobe. We have no evidence that she has temporal lobe epilepsy in any way, shape, or form, but I think it speaks to um, a few things. One is that this region is connected to other regions. Uh, 
particularly the temporal lobe, insula, the cingulate, et cetera. But that also points that if you don't find the lesion and, and the electrode is in the wrong spot, you may find something that's not really um, the, the meat of where the network is. Um, and then I won't go through these slides. So I will go through a couple of these slides. So MRI PET fusion uh, can help, like in this case, by taken by Harvey. And we, we have found this quite helpful fusing MRI with PET. And then another thing is, uh, can be complementary because it's, uh, it's objective, uh, doing statistical parametric mapping where you uh, uh, subtract the patient's PET voxel by voxel and give it a certain Z-score and you look at the regions of hypermetabolism. Sometimes the regions of hypermetabolism can be spread, but this is a gentleman with what we thought was non-regional uh, basal epilepsy, and we saw uh, hypermetabolism is inferior frontal lobe, uh, did electrode, this is an old case, so actually we did uh, uh, a grid, and then um, actually while the grid was in, we found a cortical dysplasia in the posterior orbital cortex. And then uh, I'm just gonna show you another uh, case here where MEG is helpful. So one thing when, when interpreting the MEG, and, and as in your case, is that sometimes MEG is um, so scattered dipoles. And so when they're scattered, it's not particularly helpful. So uh, it's more helpful when they're, uh, when there's five or more, they're clustered and they have a similar orientation. So this is a, uh, we haven't done surgery on this um, boy yet, uh, but we uh, plan to. And uh, so here's the, um, let me show you the, um, so there's a tight cluster of uh, dipoles. This boy has autonomic symptoms, fear, fearful expression. Uh, and then you can sort of see there's this kind of cortical thickening in the region here in the flare. Uh, and then it's rare uh, that we get ictual megs, but sometimes we get ictual megs, and they can be quite helpful. So this is a woman who, she doesn't have Serge Weber, she has a Fort Weinstein in B1, and she had a venous angioma. Venous angiomas are just incidental. Uh, however, she, uh, we were, fortuitously, she had a, uh, a seizure in the MED, and you can see here, and then we did an invasive study and um, did a resection. Uh, and then th this is an old case. So this is before I see if you actually did a good on this person. Uh, and uh, she became fever free. So to summarize, uh, and as we well illustrated with your case, you know, looking at the semiology in detail, uh, asking the family uh, questions. Because sometimes the family can provide, uh, particularly parents, they're very good at identifying subtleties that we may miss. Uh, so remember, myopia um, will lead to errors in localization. Always broaden your hypothesis, have a good perspective, uh, have other people keep you accountable. Uh, also, if one is looking for a particular focus, one will find one. Uh, I don't like the word focus because I think the brain is evolved and very complex. It's really a network, and that's what we did as network. And there are nodes, and some nodes are more important. There are primary nodes and secondary nodes. Um, and then... Um, so when one gets too myopic with a focus, the localization may not be correct. And again, the SEG electrodes are only 0.8 millimeters in diameter, so you, you will find changes wherever you put those electrodes. Uh, and it's amazing that SEG is as effective as it is. But I think one of the reasons is, is that you're, you're monitoring the depths of the cell sign. That's where seizures propagate, and two-thirds of the cortex is buried within the cell sign. So keep an open mind. Be vigilant about cognitive biases. I, I've learned this over the years uh, through my, uh, um, probably more through my errors than my successes. Um, map the network with the epileptic aura, sequence of semiology, uh, as uh, was shown in the earlier case. Uh, and then always confirm that optimal imaging has been obtained. Um, you know, some places will do a non biometric MRI, and then you can the biome averaging and not really. Uh, find the lesion, uh, and in your case, you did a wonderful job, a beautiful biometric MRI, and then correlate the network hypothesis from semiology, uh, find the lesion, decide whether you can proceed uh, with direct surgery or uh, doing SEG. And I'll end three. Thanks, Urashmo. Thank you. I guess uh, okay. yeah, for, time. for that very elegant and very nice. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Sorry about that, sir. Yeah. So uh, I will now request uh, Dr. George Jones to give his talk, and then we can have a discussion at the end of both the lectures. Great. Uh, thank you. And I'll just uh, hopefully you could see my presentation uh, uh, on on it. 
Great. Um, so I think uh, Arashmo gave a wonderful uh, introduction uh, to uh, to the background as well as the uh, pre-surgical evaluation. I'm going to just focus on the surgical uh, techniques uh, for uh, frontal lobe, and in particular, Bayesian uh, frontal epi lobe epilepsy. Um, and for time, I'm going to skip some of the, the slides. I think really, you know, when we look at it, I apologize, you know, I think there's, you know, we have a paradigm for surgical epilepsy. If there's a lesion, uh, if one can see a lesion, and in particular, uh, more likely, whether it's a cavernous malformation, uh, a, a tumor, uh, really, uh, resecting the lesion will give both the diagnostic, oncological, as well as an epileptogenic uh, benefit. If there are multiple lesions, uh, you know, the goal of the epilepsy surgery is really to, to have a focused treatment solution for the lesion that is causing the, the symptoms. And I think here it is, when there's no lesion that's detected uh, diagnostically, whether it be invasive or non-invasive, um, really it's, it'll help try to uh, identify the epileptic, epileptogenic uh, network uh, the, and hopefully be able to treat the surgical electrical uh, lesion uh, and disrupt uh, the network, whether it be a resection, ablation, or a disconnection. Um, and really, if there, you know, I think if there's no lesion, no clear uh, focus uh, or network, uh, there's options such as neuromodulation or uh, indirect uh, disconnection uh, methods uh, for these. So, looking at frontal lobe epilepsy, I know we've heard a lot. I think you know we we know it's it's a uh, Outside of the uh, temporal lobe uh, epilepsy, it accounts for about 23% of uh, partial epilepsy. A third will be drug resistant. Um, and MR, M MR or imaging negative account uh, for up to a third of the surgical cases. Um, and really surgery is uh, uh, on the frontal lobe, regardless of the location, is, is about 10 to 20% of all epilepsy surgeries. And anatomically, and I think Erasmus has done a great job, you know, I think we understand it's the largest area of the brain, accounting for up to a third of the brain surface. Anatomically, laterally, uh, you've got the limits of the central sulcus, the sylvian fissure, and the superior hemisphere. Um, whether it be you've got the precentral, superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyri. Medially, you've got the superior frontal gyrus and the cingulate. Um, and then you've got subcolosal areas, the olfactory and the parater per paraterminal gyri, and bas basally the rectus and the orbital uh, gyri. So going to the technique, if we're going to do a frontal lobectomy, a complete frontal lobectomy, the classic teaching is a supine head turn towards 20 to 40 degrees to the counterlateral side, a transcolonal skin incision, a unilateral craniotomy. The intermedial edge is about a centimeter lateral to the midline above the frontal sinus. Um, and the frontal lobe is resected from the lateral surface toward the inner hemispheric surface um, and between the anterior limits of the pars apicularis and the inferior frontal gyrus, uh, which uh, measures approximately seven to eight uh, centimeters. And you can see that. Now, for mesial frontal lobe epilepsy, and I know we did not discuss this, I think, you know, there is a paper uh, that really counts saying that, you know, this is less than one to 2% of all epilepsy surgery. And there are two approaches. Uh, the inner hemispheric approach, there's the classic inner hemispheric approach, patient supine um, and, um, and uh, uh, doing a unilateral craniotomy to approach the mesial uh, uh, frontal uh, structures. Uh, the other uh, uh, approach, as advocated by Spetzler and uh, and Lawton, is to position them lateral uh, and allowing gravity uh, to to provide the retraction necessary on that uh, ipsilateral uh, that ipsilateral frontal lobe. Uh, and I think what's uh, the adjuncts critical are the neuronavigation on ultrasonic aspirator and intraoperative monitoring. This is the one paper uh, that really summarizes uh, the largest experience of 22 patients with mesial frontal lobe uh, epilepsy, uh, looking at the uh, uh, the, uh, the patients that 19 had a, a potentially epileptogenic lesion on the MRI. They all had a workup, including video EEGs. Uh, and in 12 patients, there were extended lesionectomies according to the MRI. Uh, and then the remaining patients had, um, uh, had just resection. You can see the, the histology, whether it's a dysplasia or a tumor. Um, and I think, you know, just to really, the key here is it was the inner, inner hemispheric approach was used for the majority of the patients. Uh, and for patients that had an extension, uh, or super, uh, uh, 
a, an extent of the lesion or the focus or the uh, network above the cingulate gy- gyrus, a transcortical approach. Um, and this was the seizure control for cingulate gyrus and frontomesial cortex uh, uh, resection. You can see that uh, si- over 60% uh, percent, uh, were uh, either ILAE1 or 2 uh, uh, with control of their seizures, uh, and a really a small percentage uh, continued to have uh, refractory seizures. Now, for the Bayesian frontal surgical approaches, and I, you know, again, I apologize for speaking quickly. We can do a trans, a traditional frontal craniotomy, uh, and approach it laterally. Um, I don't know, Sarat, uh, the technique that you use, but given uh, your case there, I would have chosen, I, I would have done a superciliary eyebrow approach. I think it gives you a, adequate uh, exposure of the basal frontal lobe uh, anatomy uh, to do a limited resection of whether it be the gyrus rectus or the, you know, the F1, F2, and really be able to extend out to uh, F3. Uh, and you can see in this recent publication uh, that did a meta-analysis uh, of, of this approach um, and the exposure that one gets uh, I think it's very adequate uh, to do both lesional as well as non-lesional uh, uh, origin of, uh, of uh, 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 the epileptogenic network. Um, and really, I think the key is, you know, what is the location and extension within the frontal lobe, uh, the age of the pace, patient, the experience of the surgical technique, uh, as well as the uh, surgical adjuncts available. So I think, you know, for me, uh, really, I look at these basic frontal approaches as either the traditional uh, frontotemporal craniotomy uh, and uh, going uh, uh, above the uh, sphenoid wing uh, and approaching the frontal frossa to resect these lesions, depending upon the extension, or doing it with a super uh, superciliary uh, uh, approach to this. So I think, you know, to conclude that really basal frontal uh, lobe surgery is extremely rare uh, location to be in for the epilepsy surgeon. Um, and I think it's critical to have the surgical adjuncts, whether it be neuronavigation, uh, uh, an ultrasonic aspirator, uh, as well as intraoperative uh, ECOG, uh, to be able to safely resect these. And I think the outcomes, uh, I am not aware of any literature that looks at these uh, basal frontal uh, epilepsy, um, surgical epilepsy cases, uh, but it's highly dependent upon the etiology, the type of surgery, and the extent of uh, resection. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we are uh, have enough time for uh, questions. Yes, we do. Thank you so much, uh, George, uh, and also to Professor Erasmo for having very exhaustively and very comprehensively covered this topic very well. And it provides a very good completion to the case that we presented. So uh, yes, George, that uh, case which you showed, that approach which you showed, the supraciliar approach does look interesting. But uh, we didn't do that approach. We did an open craniotomy. And and my question is, uh, wouldn't you feel a bit limited doing a minimally uh, invasive approach for epilepsies especially given the fact that you may have to do intraoperative electrocorticography? So, I mean, it's a great question. So, you know, ideally, Surat, um, if you have, if, and I'm biased because we probably would have put in more stereo EEGs than you, and we would have had that margin, you know, we would have had it, uh, the network as well as the, the, you know, the cortical dysplasia all mapped up with the superior limit uh, lateral limit as well as, you know, the medial limit was going to be determined anatomically. If you have all that data, I think you can do a minimally invasive approach and you'll, you'll be able to put, you know, to do your intraoperative ECOGs with, you know, maybe a four, four strip, uh, 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 intraoperatively given the limited exposure. But if you don't have all the data, I think you're really going to have to do the traditional approaches. I think the superciliary approach is really good for, if let's say you're doing a lesionectomy for seizures, then I think that is, uh, that's a very suitable approach. Otherwise, it's your traditional, uh, uh, frontal, uh, craniotomy to be able to, to do the, you know, to, to get the best, uh, surgical result. Uh, so this question again to Dr. Erasmo. Uh, so, so when do you, uh, in frontal loop seizures, when you suspect that the insula is very significantly involved and you would like to cover the insula as well? 
Yeah, the question is, you're a little faint. Can you get closer to the mic, please? Sure, sorry about that. Yeah, so the question is, um, uh, insular coverage when we're thinking about funnel of epilepsy. And so it's a very good question because what happens is if, if there's a strong insular hypothesis that we're thinking of an insular perpetual epilepsy, then the approach is different because then we typically do um, orthogonal lateral oblique involving the funnel parietal operculum and also T1, supertemporal gyrus, uh, to look at this typically it's insular opercular uh, interaction. When, when we think the uh, insular is involved, but, but we're not necessarily um, thinking it's really an insular opercular epilepsy, then um, what we typically do, depending if we think it's an anterior or posterior insula, that uh, we've done longitudinal obliques through the um, through the anterior insula. So, um, um, so typically, um, um, you know, it'll kind of go sort of between the uh, um, uh, right around the middle short gyrus so, and, and then uh, the, the end ends up in the lineman and so on. So you're kind of getting that sampling. So for example, if I'm thinking it's a uh, orbital frontal cingulate epilepsy, then I would do that sort of coverage. So I'm really sampling because my hypothesis is not very strong that, that the insula is the primary generator. But if I'm really concerned about the insula, then then you really have to do the insula percular uh, approach. And again, always going... Um, in front, behind, above and below, where, where the hypothesis is at. So, so do you always place orthogonal or do you place oblique uh, electrodes as well for the insula? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so typically, if I think it's insula or percular, then I typically, um, well, I may do a combination. So I'll do, um, you know, lateral, oblique, orthogonal, you know. Um, when I say lateral, oblique, they're not completely orthogonal. There's a slight angle to them. And then I may add another electrode if I'm not getting good enough coverage, like an oblique, to cover the region. So, for example, if it's, um, it, it depends on what my hypothesis and the semiology helps. So, for example, when looking at the insula, if it's, if there's an auditory aura, then I'm thinking of the posterior long gyrus of the insula and Heschel. The Heschel kind of, you know, meets the posterior long gyrus of the insula. If someone has secondary sensory symptoms like diffuse tingling or pain, then I'm thinking of the anterior long gyrus of the insula. And then also the anterior long gyrus, the insula kind of touches on the parietal operculum. So I'm thinking about the parietal operculum. But again, going in front and back, we had a recent case of a patient with Victor pain, and the dysplasia was at the circular sulcus in the anterior frontal gyrus and would spread to the anterior long gyrus, uh, and then also then to the medial frontal region. So, and then also then if, um, uh, if I'm thinking more like, uh, with his autonomic symptoms, then obviously I want to get the ventral anterior insula. And again, just emphasize, that bench range is so tightly connected to the orbital frontal cortex, the pole, and the amygdala that um, that the seizures just spread through those regions so fast. And even when you do cortical stimulation, you see that that region gets activated. And that's the beauty of SEEG, because we could never uh, analyze these networks before with subdural grid. So uh, there's one question to you, George. So when we deal with uh, basic frontal cortical dysplasias, especially the type 1, we often have this microcellular dysgenesis, which may be negative on MRI. And there is always this tendency for this basic frontal, especially the posterior basic frontal lesions, to kind of slip over the bridge onto the temporal area through the Lyman insulae. So uh, when dealing with basic frontal lesions like this, I mean, what are the factors by which you decide whether to also tackle the temporal lobe or not? So, uh, you know, again, I think uh, that's an excellent question. For me, you know, for, for these basic frontal, I, I would probably do a traditional uh, craniotomy approach. This way I've got exposure, both the frontal as well as the uh, uh, temporal lobes. Um, um, and and re whether I approach just, you know, the, the, you know the, the extent of the resection is going to be mapped for me by the stereo EEG. And ideally, we, we placed enough to 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 map the limits of the dysplasia as well as the the network um, for lesions. Now, when I talk talk about lesions, not outside of the your FCDs, your your focal cortical dysplasias, whether it be a tumor um, or or a cavernous malformation or even trauma, right? You know, some of these kids with trauma or adults with trauma may develop basifrontal uh, epilepsy. Um, those. I tend to be, you know, I will be much more limited in in the extent of the surgical resection uh, because they tend to be a little more focal than your FCDs. Thank you. There is a question from uh, oh, yeah. Venk Venkataswamy from India. 
So I will read it out. So is boundaries of BA46 are boundaries of motor system? Is the frontal lobe connection to the caudal? Is the frontal lobe connection is caudal to rostral? Can the seizure spread to prefrontal to motor area? Why can't we see the frontal lobe syndrome after extensive resection of frontal lobe? Is the frontal to insula monosynaptic or polysynaptic action? So there are multiple questions here. So perhaps you could go through the chat box and maybe uh, between both of you, you could answer one question after another. So um, the first question is the boundaries of Rasma, you're you're distant again on your audio. Sorry. Oh, all right, thanks for that. So, um, so answer the first part of the question: the boundaries of boundaries are also. Uh, we still can't hear you. I'm sorry. I don't know. There's some. Uh, okay. I'm not sure. So uh, yeah, it's much better. You hear me now? Okay. Yes. So um, the first question: the boundaries of Broadman area four six. And I would also include eight. And typically, we're talking about the posterior part of the superior frontal gyrus and also immediately uh, adjacent to the precentral sulcus. And then also going immediately to the ventral motor cingulate. Uh, and then also laterally to the, uh, um, the, uh, the precentral sulcus, uh, the, the, the premotor areas. And, um, so those are the, those would be the bound. And those seizures are, um, I have a different semiology than what case we saw here. If it's more lateral, we may see like uh, eye version or head, head turning with the dorsal lateral or maybe even turning at 360 degrees. If we see non-integrated behavior like asymmetric tonic posturing, then we're thinking more like the, the, the medial superior frontal gyrus, but, but again, posteriorly in the ventral motor cingulate in the uh, pre-SMA uh, and the SMA region. Although one must also be aware of that semiology can also occur in the... Uh, um, the medial parietal region, particularly in the um, And then um, typically that area doesn't necessarily propagate to the prefrontal cortex um, with regard to question number two. However, this is there's a really beautiful paper which I can send you from, from uh, China where they looked at this different semiology with the seizure comes to the anterior superior frontal sulcus versus the posterior superior frontal sulcus. And the anterior superior frontal sulcus pretty much involves Broadman area 9 and 10, which is the Prefrontal cortex, and that is sort of the semiology that we see with like, um, um, like the case we saw today, or with the, maybe autonomic symptoms, or the case that I presented with the step pose and arm. As you move more posteriorly uh, at the superior frontal sulcus, when it's meeting the precentral sulcus, then that's when you start to get the non integrated behavior, like the unnatural postures, the asymmetric tonic posturing. So so, and then going to the, ne the next question, why don't we see uh, more frontal lobe syndrome? Um, you know, if you're doing a limited resection of the prefrontal cortex or even more extensive resection of the orbital frontal cortex, that, um, patients typically don't have a, um, a deficit, although that area is important for decision making and impulsivity, but it's, you know, the bilateral representation. So most patients should be well. Uh, where there's an issue is when we're involving the SMA and the motor cingulate where you get an SMA syndrome that's typically, uh, um, uh, <coughs> Transient, uh, and at the door to speak more to that. Sorry, uh, I have, uh, sorry, are uh, you muted? Sorry, yes, yes, Kensuke, please. Uh -huh. uh, I think, you know, among uh, audiences, uh, I guess there are some kind of beginner, uh, the uh, epilepsy surgeons, and so. It is important to discuss about uh, the you know surgical complications, and uh, so uh, the first uh, the so is there any uh, neurological deficits from uh, unilateral extensive orbitofrontal resection? I think no, but uh, uh, what is the idea? Um, you, you know, in in, in I think. Uh, in the unilaterals, I have not seen any uh, uh, complications uh, from uh, from this, uh, the resection of the basic frontal. Now, um, I have I have seen it um, uh, not for not in epilepsy surgery, but in tumor surgery um, uh, for the mesial uh, frontal lobe. Uh, I've seen some more, more likely to see complications with that, um, uh, the, rather than the basic frontal approaches. Okay. 
Surat, mm-hmm. and your experience? Uh, you're right. I mean, even we have not witnessed any complications, especially with unilateral resections. But there is a complication mentioned in the literature. And this includes that if, if you strip the olfactory tract bare, that could lead to devascularization and then a possibility of a CSF leak because of the atrophy at the cribriform plate. So uh, I think it's very important to uh, keep the olfactory tract intact subyearly, and the basic frontal resection should be performed subyearly so that the olfactory tract is not uh, devascularized. I think that may be a relevant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I totally agree uh, with you. And but uh, you know, uh, if the resection goes far uh, posterior and superior and involve you know some colloidal area, then uh, the there is a risk of uh, memory decline or, you know, the personality change. And uh, do, do you agree with that? Yes, that was, that's where I was going to say I've seen the, the complications is really um, uh, with, with a more extensive resection that is essentially really uh, – Extra basal frontal, really, because you're you're you're, oh, yeah. you're outside of the uh, mm-hmm. the gyrus rectus and the orbital uh, gyri. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kensuke, there is one more question. I think it's addressed to neurologists, so perhaps you could read it. Yeah, sometimes uh, FLE and penis uh, that uh, uh, psychogenic uh, seizures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, non-epileptic seizure. Yeah, event found in patients. How do you distinguish this? So oh. what is FLE, Manjari? Frontal lobe epilepsy versus psychogenic non-epileptic okay. form, uh, events. So this is a very good question because uh, the frontal lobe seizures can be very bizarre and uh, especially the hypermotor ones. So sometimes, you know, many of these patients do get confused as whether they are acting it out or they are psychogenic events. And some of them can have very stereotyped, uh, you know, body rocking, jumping up and down. So they can look very bizarre and um, funny. And uh, many times they get misled uh, uh, to being uh, psychogenic uh, events. So the difference is that most frontal lobe seizures will arise out of sleep. So if you if you're doing a video EG, then you will have sleep activity preceding the onset of the ictal activity. So that is uh, going to be one clue. The second is the frontal lobe seizures are very, very brief, a few seconds to a minute or less than a minute, whereas psychogenic events are very, very prolonged. So you will not have an event which lasts for only a few seconds in a psychogenic. They usually want to demonstrate out. So they have rather prolonged events where they are, you know, it may carry on for minutes or even uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, half an hour or so. And within that event, in a psychogenic event, you will have waxing and waning. So you will have the event petering out and then coming back again. And then you will have a very bizarre, uh, you know, uh, alternate limb movement. So you can have one hand, one leg, you can have hand and leg, you can have... uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, asynchronous movements and each event will be different from the other in a psychogenic event. So uh, a, a psychogenic uh, event, uh, there, there will be a variation, non-stereotypy and a variation of one event to the other event. Uh, whereas in a frontal lobe seizure, uh, most of the events are very, very stereotyped and brief. Uh, in a pseudo seizure, uh, the uh, the person will not injure injure himself or herself and will not, you know, usually bite the tongue. If there is a tongue tongue bite, it's usually on the tip of the tongue and it's not grievous. And if there's an injury, it's usually on the shin of the leg, which are known as carpet burns. So uh, in a psychogenic event, when you examine the patient, the eyes will be shut usually. And if you try to open the eyes, there will be a, a severe resistance to opening of eyes. And if you manage to pry open the eyes, the eyes will be looking downwards, uh, which is geotropic distribution, and the pupils will be reacting. Um, whereas in a true event, uh, because the person is an altered sensorium, usually the eyes will be deviated to the right or the left or uprolled. So there will be a Bell's phenomenon and the eyes will be uprolled in a true event. Uh, in a true event, uh, the planters will be extensive, whereas a psychogenic event, uh, the planters will uh, will be a withdrawal or, you know, they will not allow you to even examine. Uh, in a psychogenic event, uh, if you if you if you put the camera of the mobile phone onto the face, patient's face or if you put a mirror onto the patient's face, the patient will have eye to eye contact with the mirror. 
uh, unlike a true event where there will be no eye contact established between the mirror and the patient. In a psychogenic event, if the hand is put over the face during the event, the hand will fall away from the face and not injure the body. Whereas in a true event, the hand usually will fall uh, on the body and tend to injure the body or slap the body. So uh, these are, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, usually uh, the, the psychogenic events will occur in front of somebody or where there is uh, somebody to sympathize with or a crowd around. They will never occur alone. They usually do not occur when the patient is alone or asleep. Uh, whereas a true event will occur when the patient is alone or asleep and the demonstration aspect will not be there in a true event. So these are all various differences. Sometimes it can be rather difficult and we have to, uh, you know, do, an, uh, do a video EG and demonstrate uh, all these uh, features. There will be no true ictal activity. There will be alpha seen during the event. Um, so, and there will be artifacts because of the bizarre movements. So there's a huge lot of difference and uh, these differences have to be kept in mind in the epilepsy monitoring unit. The staff should be aware of how to test a patient, uh, check the pupils, check the planter, do all the tests. And, uh, you know, uh, even the reporting fellow or the, uh, the resident should be alert that sometimes in 15% of the patients, you can have a combination of true events and psychogenic events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manjuri. Uh, Salat. Yes, yes, Kansuki. Uh, there is one thing I want to, uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, beginner surgeons to uh, know about the uh, surgical skill uh, in frontal lobe epilepsy surgery. The, when you go, you know, posterior and posterior, so what is uh, the, uh, the uh, posterior most limit of uh, as a landmark? And I, so, uh, Salat, you mentioned about uh, uh, you. Uh, it is important to, to preserve, you know, the uh, uh, the you know olfactory nerve. And so, you uh, you know trace olfactory nerve back and back, and then olfactory nerve uh, uh, become kind of thick. And that is the uh, olfactory trigon. And uh, you know, uh, posterior to olfactory, uh, olfactory trigon is a perforated substance. And that is a very dangerous part, you know, because the uh, perforating arteries uh, come, uh, uh, go into the brain. So, uh, the, you know, uh, you better remember the posterior most landmark is uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, olfactory trigon. That is, I think, one thing you have to remember. That's, that's a very important point which you have raised, Kensuki. And now the point I wanted to emphasize is that the lobectomies which we do for epilepsy, the tailored lobectomies, it's not similar to the kind of lobectomies we do for the tumors. So ideally, we do all this lobectomies sub -PLA. So we preserve as many vessels as possible. And then when we go to the basifrontal area, the resection is always sub -PL. So we always have the arachnoid as a barrier for our limitation towards the surgery. And even when we go back, we always have the arachnoid over the sylvan fissure, which again gives us a very good landmark for the posterior resection. Uh, so uh, it ha one has to remember that these resections are not equivalent to tumor resections. One has to prevent as much vessels as possible and uh, one needs to respect the arachnoid barrier. So uh, Kensuke, I think we have come to the end of the session. So I would like you to provide some concluding remarks so that we may close the session. Oh, yes. Uh, the, uh, this time again, uh, the, I think uh, uh, we uh, had a uh, very, you know, uh, the uh, renowned uh, the neurologist and uh, neurosurgeons, and uh, I really uh, appreciate uh, the uh, Dr. Uh, Erasmo uh, Passaro and Joji Jallo. Uh, uh, I think uh, they contribute a lot, and uh, we learned a lot uh, from them, and. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, I, I hope uh, that you know uh, this series uh, that uh, will help you uh, to uh, uh, develop uh, the uh, epilepsy surgery program in your country. And uh, uh, the next one uh, will be about uh, the singlet uh, the epilepsy. Is that right? That's right. We yeah. will go on to the singlet epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the uh, the. Uh, uh, 
Another important uh, the, uh, the, uh, surgical part of uh, the frontal lobe epilepsy. So uh, the, now uh, and this is a kind of end of uh, the tenth uh, the epilepsy uh, surgery webinar, uh, uh, step by step, case by case, uh, presented by uh, ILA uh, Asia Oceania uh, Surgical uh, Epilepsy Surgery Task Force. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Rasmo. Thank you, thank George. You thank you, Kensuke. Bye-bye. Have a great thank day. Thank you.